Okay, thank you all for your patience. Uh, we got everything sorted out. Um, I want to welcome two speakers. Uh, Seth Van Holland is a, uh, an assistant professor at the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium, where he leads the Master in Information Science. Um, uh, Ruben Verborg uh, is a um, researcher in semantic hypermedia at Ghent University. Um, I would say more, but uh, since we're starting late, I'm just going to hand the microphone over to um, Seth. Hi everyone, sorry, uh, sorry about this uh, delay. I hope that my uh, screen is uh, showing up and that Ruben will be able to, to join in. We just had uh, normally we would have physically done this uh, presentation with the two of us, but uh, for just a logistical issue, I'll be doing the presentation or the first half of the presentation here in uh, Brussels. And at some point, uh, Ruben will take over for uh, the second half, and uh, he's based in Ghent, so I hope, just hope that we'll be able to do that transition uh, fluidly. So um, let me just check whether uh, you actually uh, see the screen. I don't think so. Um, Wait. Good. Uh, Seth, we can see this. But um Actually, I don't think that you are seeing the, the slides on uh, my screen. Could you, uh, Tom or Stefan, activate the sharing of my screen? Do you see, for example, now uh, that I'm going on the, the second slide? Ah, okay. So, Tom, could you just uh, verify that you're seeing the, the second screen, the image? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, voila. Maybe you could uh, so, turn on your, you could turn on your camera as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, all apologies for this uh, the logistical issues, but we can just uh, start now. So, um, one of the the basic points of uh, the free metadata project that we uh, started a couple of years ago was really to try to um, to see or to identify the low-hanging fruits regarding the uh, implementation and the usage of linked data principles in 2014. As you all probably know, in 2009, uh, Tim Berners-Lee launched um, this major call to uh, publish structured data on the web. And so now we're five years on, and what we notice, especially from the LIS community, we actually see that it's not that's straightforward to start uh, implementing on a large scale uh, linked data and that's why here I took this uh, wonderful image of the, the Smithsonian and in a sense I would kind of uh, put the LIS community in the role of the poor little boy who's uh, stuck in the mail bag of this uh, postman in the sense that we all are, have been very eager over the last few years to apply linked data on a large scale within our institutions but it hasn't been always very easy and at some point it's also just really hard to really understand and to grasp all the, the practicalities of converting our uh, catalogs and our relational databases into IDF. And in a sense, uh, this collaboration with Ruben is that, um, or the, the postman carrying the child, for here I see it kind of in a, in a metaphor, that uh, the postman is kind of the, the IT or the, the semantic web uh, community kind of who sometimes has a very uh, kind of academic or theoretical view on how to apply all of these principles in practice and there's sometimes really a tension between both communities so that's just kind of uh, the starting point of uh, the lot, a lot of the work that we have been doing over the last two years and so that now resulted in uh, the publication of a handbook uh, linked data for libraries, archives, and museums. So this will be coming out in uh, June and is being published by FACET. 
And so in this presentation, uh, we'll actually focus on a lot of the contents uh, of this handbook. And I hope you'll get interested in the, the different topics addressed in this, uh, in this book. But so for today, what we really want to focus on is, um, as mentioned in the title, are the low-hanging fruits, really practical things that everyone, even uh, without having a PhD in semantic web technology, that you should be able to implement all at your own pace and within your own institution. And so I will focus on the first two points. So uh, to just run through the, the structure of the presentation of today. Um, first of all, we see that an essential starting point uh, to work on linked data is to make sure that you have cut out uh, as good as possible all consistencies and errors in your metadata. And so we'll see with a practical case study how that can be done with OpenRefine. OpenRefine, which is the open source and freely available tool which we'll use throughout the different case studies. And so once we um, demonstrated how easy it can be to clean your metadata, then the second step will be uh, to see how to reconcile some of your uh, local vocabularies or even free text uh, tags or keywords with authoritative sources such as the Library of Congress subject headings. Then a third step, uh, which is also a very good example of a low-hanging fruit, is to apply NER to enrich your metadata. And uh, then a last step, which is slightly more uh, complex, is to really to think very well about a sustainable model to publish your metadata in a long term. So that's why I've put the, the coconut behind the, the last element. And so to um, start now with the, the really kind of the hands-on um, element of the, this presentation. Normally, we give these types of talks in uh, in workshops, so it can be a bit more difficult to or challenging to communicate this over webinar. But so first of all, uh, we'll demonstrate how to clean your metadata with the wonderful data of the UPenn uh, Schoenberg database of manuscripts. So you have the wonderful team at UPenn uh, Libraries in Philadelphia. Uh, which has given us the authorization to use um, the, the data of this, um, of this uh, research project. And as you'll see, it's a tremendously interesting example of how things can go wrong when encoding metadata over a long period of time. And secondly, uh, for the reconciliation, we work with a data set of the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. And then um, Ruben will present uh, the two last case studies, how to apply NER in the context of the um, data of the British Library, which they have published on Europeana. And then lastly, to wrap up the presentation, Ruben will talk about how to publish um, your metadata in a sustainable manner by using REST. And for that, he will illustrate his uh, presentation by making use of the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. But so, first of all, uh, why is it so important to have your me metadata cleaned up? A very good example of the, the problems of metadata quality can be found when you uh, consult or when you launch a query in Sigma. And so, um, here, Let's suppose that we're interested in uh, finding some triples describing information regarding Pablo Picasso. So if you launch a query, what do we actually see? So here are a bunch of um, so Pablo Picasso is the subject. Then we have a couple of uh, predicates, comments, admins, describing what exactly the, the subject is. And then we have um, concepts attached to those um, or within this, these statements, but if we as a human being interpret this information, what do we actually see? That actually Pablo Picasso is considered a home page, is considered a JPEG uh, wallpaper, and if you scroll down uh, this page, you could also actually see that, for example, uh, Pablo Picasso has the height of 30 pixels. Why? Because uh, it considers uh, a thumbnail representing Picasso as 
uh, being the person. So this is just a very simple example of how uh, in a linked data context uh, that metadata quality can be a very fragile thing and so before you upload your metadata into the linked data cloud it's of the utmost importance to make it really um, very clear what the definition what the integrity constraints and are of your different fields and how they should be interpreted and so in order to make the metadata quality discussion as concrete as possible I forgot here to uh, point out that so over the last five to ten years there has been or data quality has become a tremendous uh, field of interest. A lot of uh, academics have started working on uh, this topic. And here I would especially point out the, the book by uh, Jack Olson, which you see on the far right. Uh, so data quality, the accuracy dimension, which is by far for me the best book as he really couples uh, a conceptual understanding of data quality with very well chosen examples from different types of companies. But throughout these are uh, the, the existing literature and the research projects worldwide, a consistent problem that we encounter is that sometimes it's very difficult to couple theory with practice. And so that's why um, we have found it very important to uh, try to make the issue of data quality as concrete as possible. And again, that's why I have been extremely uh, happy to be able to work with uh, the case study of the, um, the Schoenberg database of manuscripts uh, hosted by the UPenn Library. What is really important here in this context is that um, you understand that these are data or metadata not describing manuscripts, but actually transactions of manuscripts. Um, but more information regarding actually the scope of this data set is given on uh, the website of uh, the Free Your Metadata project. So I would just recommend that during this uh, webinar or just right after, you download the, do the data and after having installed um, OpenRefine, uh, when you launch the application, it's a very straightforward uh, software tool you'll see that, um, that one of the first options you have is to create a new project. Probably the easiest thing to load the data is just to take the URL uh, which you see on the slide um, and or that URL will give you access to the CSV data so either you uh, download them locally or a second option is actually to just straightforwardly uh, copy paste the link towards the CSV file into the web address and to just click next. Normally, uh, if all goes well, you should then immediately get access to the following type of interface. So actually what you see is something which uh, corresponds more or less what a lot of people have called Excel on steroids. Excel on steroids. And, um, and so here you get a brief overview of the, the different metadata fields. So we have the typical elements such as catalog ID, uh, lot, price, currency, whether the manuscript has been sold or not, etc. current location. So these are all pretty straightforward elements. Um, so one of the first things that you can do to actually uh, play around in the Google or the OpenRefine interface, so as uh, this is uh, a detail which I should have mentioned previously, but actually um, since a couple of months the new version of Refine should have been launched or should have been published, which is called Open Refine, which is, has a new logo, but this uh, launch has had a, a, a delay and that's the reason why we're still working with uh, version 2.5, which actually still has the Google Refine uh, logo, but do note that currently it's a completely open source project and within a couple of weeks um, you'll see the, the open refine logo. But for the different exercises that we're doing, do know that it's, uh, or we would definitely recommend you to install and to use uh, the version 2.5.
But so again, once you have uploaded uh, the data, uh, what we would recommend to do is to apply uh, a couple of filters. So filters are a very easy way to launch a query in a specific field. So what you could do is uh, click, for example, on the field primary, primary seller. So you'll see, or you see these small triangle icons next to the name of every field when you click on these icons you'll have different functionalities and one of the, the easiest functionalities or one of the first functionalities you should use are the filters and so when you click on the triangle next to primary seller you can just uh, for example here on the screen I just uh, typed in AB and that will only send me or give me back all the, the metadata records containing AB within the field primary seller and then you can combine actually multiple filters across uh, different fields and so the second filter I applied was on the field uh, title and there I just typed in BEL uh, because there are a big number of uh, manuscripts uh, relating to, uh, to Belgium but these are just two very simple examples of how to use a filter in order to uh, limit the data set to a certain number of matching rows. But as you'll see, things get uh, a lot interesting when you actually start using facets. So faceting actually allows you to uh, very quickly, in a matter of half a second, to study and to analyze the distribution of values within a specific field. And so for example, um, a question which you might have in mind when scrolling through the data of the Schoenberg database. So you see that there are um, two fields, primary seller and secondary, secondary seller, so seller one and seller two. So if you're not that well acquainted with the metadata, probably it's not that easy to understand actually uh, what's the difference between these two fields. And this is a typical context where faceting can really be extremely helpful. And so if you uh, scroll to the, um, the field seller and you click on the triangle um, and then you have the possibility to apply a facet, what you will see is that on the left hand side of your, sc your screen you'll have this small box uh, popping up which you see here on the screen with the, the two blue arrows. So what you get is actually very rapidly an overview of the distribution of the different values. By default, all the different values are um, actually ordered by, um, by name, but what, uh, what is a lot more interesting is actually to um, order them by count. So by doing so, you actually put on top the most recurrent values and uh, on all the way towards the bottom, there you will have the outliers or the values which only appear once. But just by applying here a facet on both seller and seller 2, I hope that you kind of get a feeling for how you can use facets to very quickly get an understanding of the true nature and content of fields in the sense that here we actually see that for seller uh, we mainly have um, names of auction houses, but for seller two, we're actually referring more to uh, collection holders and people who um, actually collections manuscripts over time. So in this sense, faceting really helps you very quickly to understand actually what's the true content of fields, even if the title is not immediately um, self-evident. What is important here also to, to realize, and especially if you want to create um, or integrate results of faceting within a management report, for example, or a status report regarding the indexing and the cataloging of uh, your collection, you can actually click on, for example, uh, or the number of choices, which is displayed in blue. So you have, for seller, we have 2,275 choices. If you click, on that link, you actually uh, get a pop-up screen 
uh, which you see in the, the bottom of the screen. And uh, so there you then have a kind of a, a tab separated uh, list giving all the most, uh, or just giving a distribution of the different values and their number. And you can just copy paste this in Excel and make very rapidly interesting graphs uh, to be included in, um, in reports. And so uh, this is uh, one of the core functionalities in the beginning when you uh, start working with um, OpenRefine. But then uh, really kind of the powerhouse tool which uh, can give very quickly an added value to uh, using OpenRefine is the clustering. So clustering actually allows you very easily to aggregate different values regarding the same uh, reality. And so uh, to just illustrate the, how this works, we can very easily apply this, for example, on the field artist. And let's just have a quick view here on uh, what actually happens. And so here you just see, I'm sure that every one of you who's managing uh, metadata is confronted with these uh, issues. So clustering will basically group based on different methods and different um, probability um, algorithms, cluster together different spellings of the same entity. And so here in this case, um, all of the different cluster groups which are proposed are actually correct. And so in one go you can just click on ah, these, um, these values should actually be merged. And so in a matter of a couple of seconds you can very easily clean up um, different types of uh, spellings in, uh, in one go. So again this is a very simple example and in a lot of contexts you have to be careful not to apply this too rapidly, uh, but it's just a very straightforward example of how this clustering uh, helps. So that was just a very rapid overview of um, the type of operations that you could do on cleaning. And again, I would just very much uh, encourage you to download the, the Schoenberg da database uh, of manuscripts data. As you'll see within almost any field, there are major consistency issues. And again, if you're um, if you're a teacher or if you're putting up uh, a workshop on linked data and you talk about cleaning data, this data set is extremely valuable to play with. So now let's go to the, the second point. So we've seen now with a limited number of examples what are the most important or the, the easiest way to clean up or to make sure that we have consistent um, data, then the second step that we can apply is to reconcile um, certain fields with authoritative sources and by doing so to hook up within um, established vocabularies which are already a part of the linked data clouds. And so to do so, um, we would ask you if you want to start playing with um, vocabulary reconciliation. Uh, you need to download the RDF Refine extension. So this extension has been developed by uh, the Derry Research Group in Ireland. It's very easy to install. All of the instructions are here on the site, but if you would have some issues, do not hesitate to contact us. And so this will just add a plugin, making it possible to reconcile data from your data sets with uh, a Sparkle endpoint available on the web. As this can be, uh, again, a difficult operation if you don't have in-depth um, experience of how to use or how to consult a Sparkle endpoint. Um, again, it could be very useful to uh, run through the different steps of this uh, case study. So for this uh, specific element, uh, we will um, recommend you here to download the, the Powerhouse Museum data, as you'll see. It's one of the biggest uh, science and technology museums. And what is interesting within their metadata is that, with, and this is a very good example of lots of collections out there, they have um, developed an in-house uh, thesaurus, which is called the Powerhouse Museum Object Names Thesaurus font. Um, and the whole exercise or the whole point of this case study is to try to see how in a completely automated way we can link these, this local vocabulary 
to an established vocabulary which is already a part of the Linked Data Cloud. And so here we decided to work with the Library of Congress subject headings. And so um, this is really the, the essential screenshot showing you all of the information that you need to know to add LCSH as a reconciliation service. So once you have downlo downloaded the, um, the Powerhouse Museum metadata, you'll see a column called uh, keywords containing the local vocabulary. Then the second step is to download the, the RDF extension. And as you see here on the top screenshot, uh, you see the RDF button. If you click on the triangle, you then get the screen which shows you add reconciliation service and you choose based on Sparkle endpoints. Then what happens is that you get uh, another uh, pop-up which actually allows you to add more information regarding the Sparkle endpoint. Um, in the beginning of this project we have tried to, um, uh, to immediately query the, the Sparkle endpoint made available by uh, the Library of Congress itself, but we ran into a number of uh, problems. And I think probably Ruben will discuss this more in depth. Uh, for the moment, I think everyone who has played with uh, Sparkle endpoints knows that it can be quite difficult to, uh, to really to make sure that there's a sufficient uptime. Sometimes when people launch complex queries, the, the server can get overloaded and things uh, might can or can go wrong. Uh, quite rapidly. So that's why we've chosen to put up our own Sparkle endpoint. And so uh, within the top part of the screen you just add a name, you give it a name. So here you see LCSH PH Museum Test. But then the most important details uh, are in the, the, um, the second and the third field. And so there you should put in uh, the sparkle.freer metadata as the endpoint URL and then a description of the graph uh, made available by uh, Library of Congress can be found here on uh, id.log.gov slash authorities slash subjects. Then uh, we are using Virtuoso as a triple store, so just pick that uh, triple store in order for uh, or to get optimal results. But then really also an essential element um, as we're using uh, or as the Library of Congress subject headings are represented in SCOS, do make sure that you have ticked the, the box SCOS pref label before you click OK. Then uh, you launch the reconciliation here on the categories field. Um, and then what you'll see is actually, I, this is a very time intensive um, process. So do be aware that if you launch this procedure on uh, the global collection of the Powerhouse Museum or your own data and you have uh, thousands and thousands of records, do know that this process might take a couple of hours. So that's why, for example, here on the screenshot you see that I've put, I created a filter on record ID and I've put in 99 which limits the glo global uh, data sets to a bit more than 3,000 records. And this uh, then kind of um, limits the time that we need to, to wait to get the reconciliation results. But so now if we um, go towards the results, what you'll actually see, and so this is a screenshot towards the end of the reconciliation process. And so what you see is that for example, the first um, metadata records, which contains meteorites in the categories field, has turned blue. This actually means that the string of characters, which is just kind of meaningless and not really exploitable in a machine um, or in an automated setting, has been converted in a URL. And by clicking on that URL, you'll see actually that you jump to um, the page describing the concept of meteorites within the Library of Congress subject headings. And so this is really a fundamental step that you understand that we've kind of turned more or less a meaningless string of characters into 
a hard-coded link to a concept of the LCSH where more information can be found regarding this concept. But so if we scroll a bit down, we see that um, for other categories, the results have not been uh, that convincing. So for example, uh, you see that for models, actually there are different options. There's models patterns, models persons, etc. And if refine is confronted with multiple options, it cannot make a decision on its own. But what is more uh, intriguing is that if you look down on the field, uh, look down on the screen, you will see uh, a, a value called specimens. And you actually see that within LCSH, um, or two specimens values have been returned. But again, as there are two values which are here the same, Refine can't really take, um, take a decision. So something strange happens. So if we go, uh, or if we have a closer look and actually click on the links uh, which have been identified by uh, the reconciliation process, we actually see that within LCSH, we both have a URI for specimen as a main concept, a main topic within LCSH, but uh, there's another URI uh, which is actually a form subdivision within LCSH. But as there has been a match for both um, through the, the string-based matching procedure, uh, both URIs have been sent to, um, to Refine, and Refine, as such, cannot make a decision. And so this is just a very uh, straightforward example of the different types of problems which you will bump into when you reconcile um, your data with uh, data or with uh, the LCSH SCOS files as they have been made available by the Library of Congress. And so I cannot go into all of the different details, but we've put up a second version, an optimized version of the, the LCSH in which, for example, if we see that there is a clash between two URIs which actually represent the same string, uh, we will leave out the form subdivisions. And so by doing so, we managed to pump up the reconciliation uh, success rates of, I would say, 30%. And finally, we managed to end up uh, with an automatic success of around 70%. And so again, we don't have the time to go into all of the details regarding the different elements we uh, changed within LCSH in order to uh, uh, promote the automated uh, reconciliation success, but we've written a JSIST paper specifically on this, so if you're interested, in this um, topic, do consult the paper Ruben and myself wrote on this topic in uh, JSYST in 2013. So this uh, concludes the, the second case study and then uh, Ruben, I hope that you are ready in Ghent to uh, take over. So Ruben, over the next um, minutes, will describe the third and the fourth uh, case study. Okay, hi, so well, as I had um, discussed, we are going to deal with the last two parts, which are about uh, enriching metadata and publishing the metadata in the end. So um, what do we mean with enriching? Um, well, for instance, I'm sure you're all aware that you have two kinds of fields, essentially. There's the structured data and there's the unstructured data. And we all hope that we have a lot of structured data because those ones are the most easiest to deal with. But in fact, in practice, it turns out that we have a lot of non-structured data as well. So basically full text fields or fields with some other structure that are not ready to be interpreted directly by a machine. 
So for instance, in this case, suppose that we have a field with a sentence on the 25th of September 2006, we visited Washington to see the White House. So a machine cannot do a lot with this sentence because this text is in English and machines do not understand natural languages yet. So what we have to do is we have to perform named entity recognition. And this means that we will look in, well we, I mean a machine will look into this text to see what are the important entities we have here. And the first step for that is identification. So in this case we see an entity, we have a date there, the 25th of September, we have Washington and we have the White House. So the first step is to find which entities are there and there's various tricks to do that. For instance, dates always have a specific format. We can look for capital letters to, um, to find names. There's lists of those names and so on. So those tasks are performed by different algorithms. Once we have found what the different um, concepts are, the different entities are, we have to disambiguate them because for instance, this sentence has Washington in there, but Washington can have different meanings. For instance, there's a person Washington, there's Washington, the, the city of course, there's also Washington as whatever is decided in the White House. So in this case, obviously, it is about the city of Washington. Now, as a human, of course, we can use the context of this phrase to see what kind of entities we need, but machines are quite bad at context at uh, some depth. So, this is performed by a second step. Okay, so how do we associate a certain meaning with a specific entity? So, in this case, how do we say, well, this is the White House, this is Washington the city, not Washington the person? Well, basically, we do this through URLs. So, URLs, um, they have a double function. On the one hand, they can allow to give a unique identifier to a certain concept. So in this case, if we say Washington, well, we mean Washington DC as identified by this specific address, dbpedia.org slash place slash Washington. Um, so um, what also is important about URLs is that you can look them up. So if you wouldn't know what Washington is, well, you can just visit the page and check what is on there. So again, for machines, this is um, very important. Um, just um, let me quickly switch back on the lines because I, I suppose you can't really see me at the moment. Just a sec. So that will be a lot better. So um, now, NIMT entity recognition basically is a workflow. So you can do that with services. So there are various services on the web that perform NIMT entity recognition. We will see a few of those. The idea is that you take each piece of content. So let's say you have um, each record has a certain free text field. You take the text of the free text field, send it to the service, and the service will give you back. So first of all, the entities it finds. For each of the entities, or for most of the entities, it will try to find the URL, so it will try to disambiguate, and then it will, most services will also indicate the score, so that their confidence in how good or how confident they are about a certain match. Okay, so, um, well, you can imagine, if you have to do this workflow by hand, that it can take quite some time. So, the, doing it by hand, I mean, you would have to select the text of a certain record, input it into the service, click the button, wait, and then have a result, and then process the results manually, put them back into the record. So, because we don't want to do that, um, I have built an extension for OpenRefine, Google Refine, which you can use to perform um, named entity extraction yourself in, um, in the OpenRefine software, so you don't have to do the process manually anymore. Um, I will um, quickly show an example of that. So here we are in Open Refine, and we see it's, uh, it's part of the European data set of the British Library here. We see different records, and one of them, well, several of them actually are free text fields, so we will concentrate on the description field we see here. Now, in order to save a bit of time, what I will do is I will only show the demo on a couple of records. And basically, um, performing name entity recognition is a two-step process. So first, you have to configure your services. Um, so it's basically a dialogue with, um, with configuration and stuff. Don't look at my API keys there. 
And what you do is, based on those surfaces, you can then start recognition. So in this case, it is a description column you want to analyze. So we take its triangle and choose extract name entities. And we say, whoops, I'll have to zoom out a little. For instance, we want to see what um, Zamanta and the Wikipedia Spotlight can find in those three groups. So now there are different kind of services I explained. So Zamanta is a paying service. The Wikipedia Spotlight is a free service. Now the paying services are a lot faster than the free services. So if you want to do this process, it's best to try it first in a small subset, as I'm doing now, or just let it run overnight so um, that you can just have the entities recognized while you wait. So in the meantime, um, we have results for a few columns, or we should have results for a few columns. Um, so for instance, we see here that Alchemy API recognized the entity Delhi in this text. And as you can see, it is a hyperlink here. So this means that we cannot, um, it's not just a text, it is really a link. So let's see what link it is. I will follow the link now. And this uh, shows a disambiguation. So we're talking about Delhi, and we're really talking about Delhi the city, not any other of the Delhi's, and actually there are quite a few. So OpenRefine has, or the extension here, has made a decision for us that the Delhi we're talking about is specifically this one that you see over here. And this is how named entity recognition and disambiguation can be performed from inside OpenRefine. Okay. So um, you can add extra services yourself. So even the paying services, they offer a free plan which you can try. So for Alchemy and Zamenta, you can request an API key and you can use it to test out the services to decide whether those perform well for the kind of data you have. You can add them and then start recognition. So we have done it with the British Library data, and this is the um, short demo that I have shown now. So we've did this, we did this for the whole data set, and we've analyzed the, the results. And it turns out that named entity recognition is quite successful. So what we did is we performed it in an automated way, and then we've tried it in a um, manual way as well on, on part of the data set. And then we compared how good uh, the various services such as Zement and Alchemy API performed in the data, and we were quite surprised with the results. So the interesting thing here is this is a kind of enrichment that is actually quite cheap. Um, so you get a lot of um, extra added value to your data, so machines can analyze a lot more of this data using just a really simple process that is almost fully automated. So this is basically extra data quality, quality that you can get for almost free because the services are quite cheap and, and some of them are even free. Yeah, so this is a demo I just showed in an interactive way. And this brings us with the next step. Let me just quickly check my um, screencast window to see if there's no urgent message for me over there. Okay, um, after this connection problem, um, I will just stop sharing my webcam so you can hear me better. Okay, good. So now that we have metadata that is clean, that has been linked to other sources, and that has been enriched, so that we have linked to various other data sets as well, we are ready to publish it. One of the um, pieces of added value that we realize by doing named entity recognition is that we've linked our data to other data sets on the web. Now, if you publish data, it will be linked to those data sets. We've tried this with data from the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. Well, how um, should you expose data? What is the best way to do it? The thing is, the final answer to this question has evolved over time. In the old days, it used to be HTML, then it was suddenly XML. Around 2005, it started to be JSON. Now we have to publish RDF. Basically, how do you have to do it? Well, it seems that the answer is, well, you need an API, obviously, because your website is not enough. But what should we do? Do we need JSON for web applications and RDF for intelligent clients? So does it mean that we need one website and two APIs? Clearly, the model of just building APIs is not so sustainable. So therefore, we propose to follow the principles of the REST architectural style. And the important thing with REST is that you don't need an API because your website is already an API. The only difference between machine clients and human clients is that those machine clients require different representations. 
Machines don't understand HTML, they don't understand English, so we need to give them different representations. But the whole information structure, the whole server infrastructure can be exactly the same, and I will now show you how. So what REST is basically, REST is a set of constraints, a set of guidelines, and if you follow them, you get sustainable publishing of data. And sustainable in this case means that you acknowledge that technology will change, that you will have to build support for new formats, support for new clients. But you try to do that by changing as few things as possible. So REST has several constraints and the most interesting ones, the most relevant ones, are the uniform interface constraints. And basically the uniform interface consists of four parts. They are resources, representations, self-describing messages and hypermedia. I will quick we want to do the different parts here. So, um, no, first a little more about the data set. So, um, the Kubernetes data set is available at collection.kubernetes.org. So, basically, they have exposed their uh, collection in a restful way. So, I really encourage you to try that for yourself. Yeah. So, basically, the first constraint of the REST uniform interface are resources. So. URLs should identify resources. They shouldn't identify technology. Because if URLs identify technology, then basically you're sure it won't be sustainable because technology changes, for sure. The only constant in technology change. So if URLs contain parts of technology, then I can guarantee you that you won't be able to use them within five years. For instance, on the left-hand side, we see URL example.org slash collection slash show object dot ASPX. Now, already we have a few questions here. I mean, what is this URL? Show object is an action, but what object will it show? ASPX is a technology, but is this relevant? Do I need to know this? Can I bookmark this URL? If I share this URL, what will you see? Will you see the same thing that I see? Maybe not. On the right-hand side, we see a URL that clearly does identify an object. It doesn't talk about a specific technology. It doesn't need to say whether this thing will be HTML, JSON, or RDF. It just identifies a conceptual resource. So if I'm, for instance, if I'm representing a museum, then this could be the URL of one of the objects in my collection. So this is what it is. It identifies a resource. You can bookmark it. You can share it. And it can remain unchanged for the next 20 years. As long as the object exists in my collection, I can keep this URL because it identifies this object and nothing else. So now that we have this one URL for an object, how can we access it? Well, the idea is that each resource can have multiple representations. To, and it's, the best way to understand this is to look at your bad example. So on the left-hand side, we have an example that, for instance, the URL example.org objects and a number gives us HTML. But if we have an application and we want to access the JSON version, then we have to use a different URL. And notice how this is really strange because the one URL is supposed to identify the object and so is the second one. But apparently we need two different URLs just because we have different clients accessing the same object. So this is a fallacy because can you bookmark this? Well, yes, but what URL should you bookmark? Will this be used by an HTML client or by a JSON client or something else? And can I share this? Well, if you are an autom automated client and you're browsing JSON, then you cannot share this URL with HTML clients because they use different URLs. What we should do, and this is the right-hand side, is have a single URL, a single resource for, different, uh, and for, different, for the same resource, but it should offer different representations. So basically, an HTML client should, if it uses this URL, it will get HTML. A JSON client, if it uses the same URL, will get JSON. So this way you can bookmark a URL and reuse it across different systems and share this. And te technically speaking, under the cover, this is enabled by a process called content negotiation. So the client says, well, those are the formats that I support, and please serve it, give me something like that. I will quickly show you how this works in practice. So suppose that we are looking at a list of um, objects, for instance, of the Cuba, Cuba uh, Museum. Let's um, have a look at this list of objects. So notice how this URL in this case doesn't identify the technology of the server. It just says, well, this is a list of objects in this case. And I have a nice object, which is a sketchbook showing same look. 
So here we are. This is an HTML representation of this specific object. Now I will copy this URL and I will pretend to be a machine. And I will use the same URL to get turtle out of that. So um, now I will, ha I will have JSON because JSON is maybe a bit easier. So you see this is the same URL I'm copying here. And I get it back in JSON. So this means that my JSON clients here can talk with the HTML clients. They can just exchange identifiers. I can do the same with turtle as well and we get the same thing back in Turtle. So note that different representations have different features. For instance, this representation here, it had images, the JSON representation didn't. The RDF representation is still very short, it's not complete yet. So this shows how we can have different representations while the API is still in development. So this API supports HTML clients, JSON clients, and RDF clients, but the RDF clients will at the moment get a little less. But we can keep on evolving, keep on changing the API. The URIs will stay the same, but RDF clients will have more and more. And if in the future some new format emerges that is not JSON or RDF, we can keep on using the same URL, the client can get a different form. So this is the um, resources and multiple representations thing. You don't need two APIs, you just need two representations. Another thing of the uniform interface is that messages should be self-describing. So each message to tell everything that the server and the client need to know to interpret the message. For instance, here we see an example where we say, give me all the objects that are toys, for instance. Jupyter it has quite a few toys here. And then a second message says, okay, now give me page two. But if you look at this particular message in isolation, it is meaning, meaningless. Page two of what? So the good example here on the right-hand side is the second message here says, I need page two of the toys. So each message would work in isolation because this URL cannot be bookmarked because this content, context will be lost. This URL can be bookmarked because the context is in the URL itself. And then, oops, sorry, then finally, um, the fourth constraint of REST is use of hypermedia and all representations. So of course, as you know, on HTML, um, HTML web pages, you can click. So if we want to see, let's say, um, more drawings, for instance, we can follow a link uh, to the type here. Or if you want to see more objects by the same artist, more objects, we can just follow links. This is how the web works. Now, the thing is, people often forget that the web for machines is also a web. So you should also keep on using URL. So in this case, the JSON representation of the bad example shows just an identifier. But what am I supposed to do with this number? How can I use this? This is not really meaningful here. The right-hand side shows, well, it's not a local identifier, it's a URL. So if you want to see the producer of this specific object, just follow the link. So basically the fault rest principle says that all of your representations should contain hypermedia controls, should contain links, so that each client, humans, applications, machines, are able to consume your API without reading any documentation. Here, you have to read the documentation to know what you should do with the identifier. Here, you can just follow a link and see for yourself. So this is how you can get APIs working without any documentation. So to summarize all this, well, what happens if you don't follow the REST principles? Well, unfortunately, DPLA, the Digital Public Library of America and Europeana, they show us two examples of that. So if you are a person, then you can just follow this URL in the browser and you will have an object of a DPLA website. But don't try to use this URL if you're a machine because you will get the HTML and as you know, machines don't understand HTML. If you're a machine and you want to use your um, DPLA or European, what you have to do is you have to register for an API key. You have to, as a human, receive a mail with this key. Then you have to take this key and an object identifier and compose the URL using the template, open it, and so on and so forth. But why are we making this process so complicated? Why did we need a second API in the first place? DPLA would have been much simpler if humans, machines, and any other system could just use the same identifier of an object to get representations. So concretely, uh, humans in a browser use this URL and we see HTML. Machines can also use this URL and get JSON. So this already works. This is no new technology. REST is as old as the web itself. It's now time that we start using it. Um, so here is the browser example again, and here is basically what you get if you use it as a machine. So um, 
this was all what I had to say about the REST interface. I will now um, give it back to Seth to finish up this presentation. Seth, I hope you are ready. Thank you, Ruben, for uh, presenting the two last case studies. So uh, I hope that everyone kind of got at least kind of a, a touch of or a hint of the, the different elements that we really wanted to communicate. And so the, the key message is really in order to have everyone experimenting or have everyone understanding linked data, we both think that it's really important to just get, get your hands dirty to download and to work with the data. And so for the moment, for us, one of the easiest options is uh, to, to work with uh, OpenRefine. And so by going to the Free Your Metadata website, you can download all the data you need to start playing around with uh, cleaning, reconciliation, applying NER, and also there's the data platform which you can use to uh, experiment with the RESTful inter interface which Ruben uh, just demonstrated. So the handbook uh, should be out on the market on the 19th of June. Uh, AILA is actually or will be responsible for the US and a Canadian edition. Um, so we'll be more than happy to uh, take questions from you. Uh, it's perhaps also important to mention that we'll, I, starting from September, we'll be giving quite a lot of uh, workshops and seminars in uh, Europe. And starting from January 2015, we also have a bunch of dates in the US. So if you're interested in kind of talking to us or to just organize a practical workshop uh, with us, just get in touch and we'll be very happy to, uh, to work together. So um, again, we do apologize for the chaos at the beginning, but we hope that there are uh, a couple of questions from you and that we're able to uh, have a bit more kind of interaction with uh, the participants. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you are kind of moderating the discussion or if you are aware of any uh, questions. Yes, I am. Uh, I have one question here. Um, maybe we can turn our cameras on for the uh, discussion. Um, yeah. So how does this refine process expand into a relational database environment? It seems dodgy to attempt this with anything other than a flat file. Are there recommendations for these considerations? Very good question. Um, so for the moment, uh, you're entirely right that uh, refine only accepts uh, flat files. You can ingest uh, RDF XML, but this has to be uh, flattened out. And so probably to make this uh, conversion uh, from a relational database or a complex XML file, you might need to have some help from a database manager or the, the person who has in-depth knowledge of the XML structure. Uh, but in most of the projects we've done, it's definitely possible to make this uh, conversion. But you're entirely right on that you can't just ingest um, an information system or um, a relational database or a complex hierarchical XML file like that into uh, OpenRefine. So there is a preparation phase uh, needed, but in a sense this is also an advantage because, uh, or a kind of a requirement, you would not want uh, someone to immediately work straightforwardly on the data, so you really need a kind of a buffer in between uh, the different operations that you're doing in Refine and then your actual uh, data. So in any case, you will need to kind of to go back and forth in between the data and the operations that you're doing in Refine. And at some point, if you're happy with uh, the transformations that you've done, then you will need to kind of to convert that back into your uh, primary uh, information system. I don't know, Ruben, if you have uh, any addition to this? No, 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 I, uh, I agree on that. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, we have another question here. Um, it says, great presentation, thank you. Can you recommend a good REST text to learn from? Uh, so as in a, a good book, I presume, or a good um, reference somewhere? Was that a question? Yes, uh, I yeah. imagine. Uh, so a good book yeah. or website mm -hmm. or... Uh, so, uh, well, actually, um, 
I have good news. O'Reilly has recently um, has published a really good book on um, RESTful Web APIs. Now, the good news about this is that it's their um, second book, and they have made the old book called RESTful Web Service uh, available for free. So, if you just want to have a quick taste of what REST is about, um, go to the website restfulapis.org, and there you will find the link to the old PDF of the old book for free, so you can just ha have a look at that. And then the, um, I also highly recommend that the new book is written by Mike M. Emerson and Leonard Richardson. And um, they also give some teasers on the website. So this is definitely worth checking out. Um, in general, O'Reilly has a few books about REST and, and hypermedia that I highly recommend. But RESTful Web APIs is definitely the first one to go for. And of course, in our handbook, there's also an applied section on how you can use REST specifically for linked data and use cases that the LAM community is interested in. Okay, we have a question here for Ruben. Uh, how does example.org slash object slash number know to provide HTTP, JSON, or XML? Okay, that's a very good question. And if you can still see my screen, I will just show you that. Because um, this is the thing I briefly mentioned, it is content negotiation. So what it is, the URL identifies a resource and it is negotiated what kind of representation the client gets. So um, if I just, so now curl is a software that gets me, um, gets me representation of something. So if I just ask for something by default, it will send me HTML. So I will try to show you what this process uh, looks like in detail. Um, so, voila. So what you see is, if the server replies, it will give you a couple of headers. It will say, well, whatever you're getting from me now is HTML. This is what it is. Now, if I am a client, I can let the server know what my preferences are. So in full, this would mean, and I said, I send an extra header to the server. I say, look, server, actually, I am a client. I don't understand um, text slash HTML. I only speak, let's say, text turtle, for instance. So I um, the same URL, notice that, so the URL hasn't changed. I just say I'm on turtle this time. Now we get turtle. The same can happen also for JSON, which is application slash JSON. So the answer is, it is in the metadata. If I send a request, there's always metadata involved, and I can choose to say what kind of representations I accept, and that way the same URL can give different representations, and that way you can have interoperability between systems that use different representations. Okay, we have a question here. How can one get a review copy of the handbook? Ah, I forgot to uh, mention that, but so uh, we'd be very happy to uh, send out a massive load of uh, books if people are uh, willing to review them. So if you have a blog or if you have some kind of uh, publication platform um, uh, and you're willing to write about the, the book, send us an email and we'll get you in touch with uh, the editors at Facet and uh, they will send you uh, a review copy for free. Um, so basically the answer is just send us an email and uh, well, or tweet about it if you have Twitter, just contact us. Yeah. Oh, okay, we have another question here about reconciliation. What is the next step after you've identified uh, or matched uh, an LOC concept or subject? So once you have, or the, the, the whole added value of this step is that um, you've converted a meaningless text string, just a bunch of characters, into a URI which identifies a concept. But so it not only identifies a concept, it also gives you access to extra information, so the, the broader terms, uh, more specific terms if they're available. So basically all the documentation, the extra metadata that LCSH has uh, made available to its, um, to its subject headings. But obviously a very big pain points on which we'll still have to work over the next few years is uh, unidirectionality. So in order for the, the web to work, Berners-Lee very consciously decided that if I refer to LCSH, LCSH is completely, or the Library of Congress is completely agnostic of the fact that I'm reaching out to that concept. So until now it has been very complex uh, 
to uh, actually say, ah, who's everyone who's, who has been linking to the concept uh, specimens in LCSH? So at, there are some, uh, for example, in a blogging context, or there are very specific um, examples where, for example, you, couldn't, yet you can use uh, Google with this uh, link, double uh, dot, and then the URL of a website, and it will show you for some uh, specific context all the incoming links. And also Sparkle endpoints uh, provide you the possibility to jump back and forth in between triples. But in the current state of the web, it's still extremely difficult to actually to build up uh, or to maintain an index of uh, backlinks. But I think for I actually Ruben and myself were uh, for the moment writing an article on this specific uh, topic. It's called the map and the territory. Uh, but perhaps Ruben can uh, go a bit deeper into this and perhaps also mention the fact that CDC, one of the major solutions or tried some uh, solutions that was proposed to deal with this issue in a sense actually failed. So yes, well, on the web, links go in one direction, as, as Seth has, has mentioned, and this has a lot of high scalability because if you don't have to know who's linking to you, you don't have to keep a list, so you can keep on growing without looking too much at others. Now this is a problem for a lot of data, for instance, um, even for simple queries you can get into trouble really fast. If you, it is really easy to say, well, was this certain person born in Washington? You just look up through linked data, the referencing the URL of the person, you will see what the birthplace is. But if you go to the URL of Washington, you won't get a list of all people that were born there because this list is really huge. And these are the kind of problems that cannot be solved with linked data out of the box, so we need extra frameworks on top of that. One of the things that we are currently looking at are linked data fragments. So if you want to know more about how to solve those issues, um, look for linked data fragments. Okay, we have a question here. What uh, organizations and websites provide linked data and what technologies do they use to do so? Uh, that's quite a broad uh, question, but um, I think the, the case studies in the, the handbook, or especially Cooper Hewitt, so if we talk about a museum context, then Cooper Hewitt is definitely the most interesting um, institution within a cultural heritage sec uh, setting, and which is really kind of showing uh, the strategy which other uh, institutions should use. Uh, we've talked about uh, DPLA, about Europeana. They put a lot of efforts into uh, providing their data as linked data, as Ruben demonstrated. Perhaps things could have been uh, done uh, differently. Um, I don't know, Ruben, if you have kind of yeah. So the feeling that uh, I think we share, um, said to myself, having seen a lot of practitioners over the years, is that people are afraid to get things out. They are afraid that you know if the linked data is not perfect, then then you know, then not bring it up. Now, as as uh, we've already seen in the example, I've shown you HTML, JSON, and RDF representations, and the RDF representation was a lot smaller than JSON. So this is any case that look, you don't have to do everything as linked data yet. Start with the small things, even if it's just for each object you offer, start with offering a title. Let's say this resource has this title. And maybe later on you can add things like, okay, so this object has been made by this person. This is a person. This is a category, and so on and so forth. So start small. You don't have to do everything at once. And one of the easy things to get started fast is RDFA. So instead of just going for full RDF or turtle, you just start adding markup to existing pages. That way clients that consume HTML can already get RDF out of it, already linked data out of it, because they can parse RDFA into RDF. So start small and don't be afraid to get out little things. First get data out, get it used, and then only start correcting it, because your linked data will never be perfect. But you can have some linked data already, so start with that. Okay, uh, Seth, Ruben, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. And um, if there are no further questions, I'd like to just um, ask if you have any closing remarks. Other, uh, um... uh, 
Uh, I've been very happy to provide this uh, presentation. It's a bit of a challenge to kind of to, to try to communicate the, the hands-on approach in uh, the format of a webinar, but still we hope that participants will be uh, motivated to just to start downloading or to, to using uh, OpenRefine in uh, combination with the different data sets we provided. And I think uh, probably also speak for Ruben, if at some point you encounter some issues or you have an interesting data set yourself which you want to share, just get in touch and we'll be more than happy to continue this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're trying things yourself, if you get stuck, if you have questions, I mean, even after this webinar, we are still reachable and we're interested in the kind of difficulties that you're experiencing because this is exactly the kind of issues we want to know about and we want to help find solutions. So if there's anything, get in touch. I think that's the most important closing in the market. Yeah. yeah, one one last minute question. Where is the best place to get this introductory information? So the uh, website freermetadata.org um, already offers a few um, tutorials, basically, that you can just follow step by step to get started. So I would really recommend that. It, it's all free. It's all available for anybody to use. So freermetadata.org has some starting tutorials. And over the next few weeks, we'll put a lot more information uh, online on that website. And so uh, even for people who do not want to buy the book, etc., uh, almost all of the concrete data and the concrete examples will be freely available uh, on the website. Good. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to close the, close the, um, uh, the session. Thank you all for, uh, for attending. And um, there, the recording will be made available uh, within about uh, two days, I think, the, all of you who signed up for the uh, webinar will receive an email message with a link to the recording. So thank you very much. Session closed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.